Pending climate disaster, we cannot keep relying on renewables that will require large batteries made of rare earth metals that we are already running out of. We will never fully decarbonize if we do not use nuclear power and, and learn how to use it well and efficiently. If the environmental movement does not support nuclear power, that is when climate disaster will happen, that is when they will fail. A few things said in this speech firstly, on characterization, secondly, on why this is an effective form of activism, and finally, on the environmental benefits of nuclear energy. Firstly, on characterization. Part one is to explain what we think the status quo looks like. Firstly, we're going to explain what the current environmental, what the current environmental movement's policy on nuclear is, and that is to say that the policy is do not touch it, avoid it. Why is this true? Firstly, because of the perceived opportunity cost of nuclear versus renewables. That is to say, historically, renewables were a more like speculative benefit as opposed to nuclear technology that has existed for a long time. Therefore, people required more convincing on renewables. Therefore, the environmental movement spent more energy on it. Secondly, in terms of decarbonization, historically, the environmental movement crucially had to avoid political pitfalls. That is to say, until the last 20 years or so, they were not a mainstream movement, they did not have a lot of support, and nuclear energy was something that scared people because of things like Fukushima. So therefore, they had to, in order to avoid those pitfalls, they had to focus on renewables. This means that they had, therefore, like, have not touched this sort of policy at all. Secondly, what does nuclear energy look like? Firstly, that is to say, the EU currently, a, the, a lot of countries, including the EU, currently are already using a lot of it. They already have a lot of nuclear plants and already rely on it, including also the US and South Korea, which already uses like a quarter of its energy as nuclear. So clearly, this is something that is already like exists and already works fairly well. Secondly, but crucially, the difference is that because of nuclear fears, the rate at which new plants are being built is rapidly declining. The rate at which old plants are being built is declining because building these things is very resource intense. It necessarily requires a lot of political capital, so when people are scared, governments just do not build these build new plants. Third thing to say is that a lot of research is currently happening into nuclear power, particularly nuclear power that is, say, like thorium-based. Crucially, this is power that is safer and it is more efficient, but it is very difficult to implement at scale because there is no mainstream push for nuclear power, so this research happens much slower and gets underdeveloped. Second thing to explain, what does advocacy look like? Firstly, they just prioritize it in terms of their energy advocacy, but that is to say they do not need to abandon all renewables, and logically they would not do this because firstly, the, the crucial reasons why nuclear energy is good is because one, it's good in the transition, two, like renewables, but secondly and crucially, it is super important as to supplement the, the cases in which renewables cannot provide, um, so they would necessarily not support like entirely replacing renewables with nuclear, that would be silly. Um, and secondly, we think that this looks like a particularly strong emphasis on responsible dis storage and disposal of nuclear waste. This is something that they are likely to care about because nuclear waste is often particularly bad for the environment and because it is one of the big fears weaponized against nuclear energy. So likely a big component of the activism is doing that well. Thirdly, they're likely to try and dispel myths and fears. That is to say, they're likely to do things like tell people facts about what nuclear power is actually like. Things like, every, if you if you added up every death in the world from nuclear power, it has still saved lives because fossil fuel plants also have accidents. People also die there. Fossil fuels pollute air quality. People die because of that. I didn't know this until 
chill crap. I think that's kind of cool. Nuclear energy is cool. Thirdly, you can. Uh, and thirdly, we think that. Um, yes. Awesome. So the second thing to explain is why it is necessarily effective activism, and this is to prove why this is just a useful use of capital of the environmental movement. Firstly, the environmental movement has a lot of sway currently. That is to say, it's a very broad movement, and it's also a very global movement with a particularly unified cause of stopping the impending climate crisis, which is something that people care about. Which means that necessarily people will listen to environmental activists and they will change their mind when environmental activists use this messaging. Secondly, when pitching it to governments, they're likely to frame this particularly well and strategically. That is to say, firstly, they're going to like they're going to encourage the fact that you can do onshore energy production. A lot of governments are worried about things like international supply chains because of disruptions like COVID, Ukraine. Uniquely, nuclear does not rely on using rare earth metals from across the world. That will appeal to governments. Secondly, in pitching it to developing world governments, they're likely to emphasize how it is something that is stable and therefore can be used to support large economies like India and China as opposed to renewables, which are far less stable and require lots of storage. And thirdly, to the extent that people are scared, they are obviously going to be strategic in where they push this advocacy. That is to say, they are likely to focus on big polluting countries like China and India, and it will probably be somewhat unreasonable for them to prioritize this in places like Japan, in which people are particularly scared of it, and which are also just less useful because they don't pollute as much. And secondly, even in those countries, because of changing demographics, people probably still support it. So the impact at the end of this, you should see to the extent that the environmentalist movement has limited capital, they are likely to be able to do this in an incredibly strategic way that will be very helpful. So final thing then, I'm going to explain the massive environmental benefits of encouraging a transition to renewable power. This is our clearest path to victory because I'm going to explain why if you successfully prioritize this, that leads to massive, massive benefits. So, first thing to explain is just simply why nuclear is a really, really good form of energy. Firstly, it requires no emissions. Once you've built the plant, it is there. It does not use any emissions to continue running. Secondly, we've gotten pretty good at storing nuclear waste. That is to say we know how to seal it in barrels, we know how to encase it in concrete, and we're increasingly finding ways to recycle it and use it again. Secondly, it's very hard to store it's very hard to store power that comes from renewable plants. That is to say that you have to make massive batteries that capture the energy from the whole plant, like the whole solar plant, etc. This requires a lot of resources and it's particularly hard to build. You do not need to store nuclear because you can change the rate at which you produce it like in, by, by whatever the population needs. But thirdly, the extraction, that you, the, you, the extraction that is required to make these batteries is particularly bad. That looks like the extraction of lithium, cobalt, etc. The extraction and mining of these metals poisons people's water. It makes land unarable. It's a massive harm and we should avoid using these batteries as much as possible. But fourthly, there is also just a lot of geopolitical and social harms to relying on batteries. That's because it concentrates power in states in which they have the processing power and raw materials, states like China, which currently holds, holds almost in a monopoly on processing the metals required for batteries, and also the social harms of extraction of the countries in which the metals are actually mined from the ground because of all the environmental harms from that. The comparative is that nuclear components require just there is far less of them that need to be mined, and where they are mined, things like thorium is often mined in Australia, which has fairly good regulations. But the second reason why nuclear power is good because we can make it better. That is to say that when you have more advocacy, you have more attention on nuclear power. That is when you are able to do things like facilitate research into fusion energy, into thorium nuclear, which are far more efficient, which produce far less waste, and the waste is radioactive for far less of a time. And people, this means that people, crucially, the more in which these forms of renewable energy exist, the less people will be scared of that nuclear in a reinforcing loop in which you get more of it eventually. But note here, crucially, the countries are always going to continue to use the nuclear that they have existing. So even if you don't believe that we built any more nuclear plants. Just by making these existing plants better and more efficient because of all the research we get, we can already win just on that. But secondly, and in terms of nuclear waste, we get far better nuclear waste policy on our side. And the framing of this is that we think that the movement, it would be quite silly for the environmental movement to remove themselves from the conversation, given that nuclear waste is something that people care about and it is a risk. Why are they excluded from this conversation currently? Firstly, they often just refuse to even engage with the idea of nuclear because they have such a don't touch it stance, which means that they don't never talk about trying to manage harms, only just trying to avoid them at all costs. But secondly, when they do take an anti-nuclear stance, they are often just not seen as sensible by governments because of the practical benefits of nuclear, so they are therefore actively excluded from those conversations. How do we make nuclear waste better on our side? Firstly, we just enforce regulation so that you have, like, we enforce regulation so that you have better and stricter regulations in storing that nuclear waste, particularly in places like developing countries. But secondly, we probably just encourage research into better ways to store it, etc., more ways to recycle it, and all of that. And then the final reason why nuclear plants are like so particularly beneficial is because they can operate on just such such large scales that no other renewable can't operate on. That is to say that they are able to be dynamic and change their needs based on the amount of energy that you actually need. You can make it go faster and produce more energy when you need, as opposed to renewables, which only run based on the weather, etc. And you do not require storage in the way that you do with renewables.
The impact of all of this is that on our side, we get a fast transition to decarbonisation. We build more nuclear plants, we make existing nuclear plants more efficient, and you should weigh this material so highly in the debate, because even if we only build one more nuclear plant, even if we only make 10 nuclear plants more efficient, that fastens, that, that makes decarbonisation faster, that prevents all of the massive, massive harms of climate change, that slows down the rate at which water rise, that slows down the rate at which islands go underwater and people are forced to move. Any more nuclear plant that we build is already a massive win. So, so proud to affirm. Organisations like Greenpeace hate nuclear power and have always advocated against it because they recognise and have always done that there are enormous risks when it comes to nuclear power. Before I get into this speech, what I'm going to do is provide you with a really important piece of framing for which I think it's unique to view this debate. That is to say, the climate movement and climate activists can only get support for transitions to clean energy when they prove that that transition is quick, that it will be cheap and that it is reliable. And what I will do in this speech is prove to you that nuclear is none of those things. In fact, we get far more harms on side affirmative. So, the first thing I'm going to talk about in this speech is why nuclear energy is unbelievably politically unpopular and why you have to believe that regardless of whether or not the climate movement actively prioritised or heavily prioritised um, like, um, advocating for it, they would affirmatively just like, don't actually prove that they are able to ever like get the benefits they want to talk about i'm going to talk about why now the first thing to note here is just the backdrop of nuclear disaster that exists people are terrified because of things like chernobyl and things like fukushima this is very scary you don't need to believe that nuclear power is actually scary or dangerous to buy this argument you just have to believe that for a lot of people for the average person they are very terrified of nuclear power they do not like the idea of there being a nuclear plant near their home they do not like the idea of there being a nuclear plant anywhere near any of their families that means that you will just like but you will never be able to get the support that you want for nuclear power the second important thing to note under this argument is that there is just an enormous outflow of money required to set up like a nuclear power plant and like and this and like, Importantly here, because to, get to concretize or to get have the benefits that you want to talk about be tangible, you have to believe that these nuclear power plants will open. But the amount of money required to set them up is just quite extreme, because it's far more expensive than the switch to any actual form of renewable energy. Because, but also, because even, and even once you do things like buy the land, build the power plant, you, and like put all the infrastructure in place for nuclear power, which is very complex, you then have to also do things like fund constant safety programs. And they minimise, they try to minimise the idea of storing nuclear waste by saying we're very good at it, but it is A, very expensive, and also, it's very, very important. So this is not a cost you can ever skip on. This is to say that relying on nuclear power is so unbelievably expensive that it is ridiculous to think that any like sane government would ever actually 
want nuclear power in their country and they're just likely to never push for it. The next thing I'm going to tell you then in this speech is why nuclear is far worse for the environment than what we offer, than what we bring to you on side negative. Noting here, we think that the alternative and what the world that we're operating in is one where the environmental movement continues to push for things like renewable energy. They tend to push for things like solar, wind or hydro. Noting that the type of energy they actually push for is probably like dependent on the community or the project we are talking about, but noting that we think all of these forms of renewable are actually far better. Why is it, what is the first reason why nuclear is particularly bad for the environment? First thing, it just uses an insane amount of water, right? Nuclear power, because of the cooling required, but like once you like, the cooling required in the process uses such a huge amount of water, we think this is something that is like a particularly large, um, like is unsustainable because it's just not something we actually have access to. Second thing we would tell you is that lithium and uranium are not renewable and the process of fracking is particularly bad. I'm going to respond here to the claim we get from First Affirmative that the idea that we could, that this prioritising looks like researching into thorium power. Firstly, this is particularly speculative, therefore you can't assume that they will get this sort of nuclear power anytime soon. Obviously at the point where we are in a climate crisis we would take like guaranteed change in the short term over a speculative good change in the long term, which is at best what they're bringing in with thorium power. Obviously, Otherwise, if, they, if we're relying on what nuclear power looks like if it was to be implemented today, we're talking about things like lithium and uranium, which are not renewable, and the process of fracking causes an enormous amount of environmental harm. That's worse for the environment. Third thing to say under this argument, then, is that climate action is required now. Not tomorrow, not next year, right now. And nuclear, the infrastructure required for nuclear power plants requires many decades to build. You cannot do this in the short term. It is literally not possible. The safety frameworks and all of the infrastructure required takes a really long time. So even at their best case, where every, you believe every single part of their case, you are still looking at a benefit that will not concretize for many, many years. Solar power is ready to go. Wind farms are working and we have access to them in the infrastructure that's far easier to implement. That is the comparative. Obviously, we win there better for the environment. The third thing I'm going to talk to you then about in this speech is the cost of nuclear. Which is to say, what does it take to build a nuclear plant? Because I think the impression you get from the side affirmative case is it's quite easy. They just sort of like pop up when we want one. And that is just simply not the case. Because building a nuclear power plant requires the literal construction of the plant, requires distribution channels, which are very expensive, and then relies on things like waste storage, which is also very expensive. I want to find a couple of things here. The cost associated with this means that the likelihood of them, like the likelihood of their argument about like emerging economies being able to sort of do this themselves and not rely on international supply chains is obviously just very unlikely because of the costs associated with this program. I think it is unreasonable to expect that a country like China or India could afford to run a nuclear power program that could power their entire country when they simply do not have the economic like uh, capability to do so. That is an enormous cost that just exclude that, whereas it is far cheaper on the comparative to do things like provide solar and stuff like that. We think that is particularly important to note here. But the other thing we would tell you is that it's not just that it is far, is that the cost of nuclear therefore we think is far, like far too great to ever actually like, to ever actually be implemented. And I think the important thing to note here as well is that it is far easier for the environmental movement to take a win on something that is easy for you to implement. It is far more persuasive or far easier to convince people to do things like put a solar panel on top of their house or like far easier to convince the government that they should put like a small wind farm out in waters that they already own that are currently unutilized because that is a limited cost. It has very little impact on the daily lives of people because people's lives aren't actually impacted by that. And therefore we think that, that on that comparative alone, people are far more likely to therefore buy into those sorts of changes in energy usage and far less likely to buy into nuclear. That's really important. The final part of this speech then is I'm gonna talk about the impact of nuclear on developing countries and minority communities. Um, three things here. The first, it will never be accessible for developing countries. It's too expensive and they lack the infrastructure. But by comparison, I think it was a really important note here, is the infrastructure they do have makes things like the implementation of hydropower actually really, really easy because developing countries already have dams, which is like by far the biggest piece of infrastructure required in generating hydropower. That is to say, it is relatively simple to transition a developing country with like a dam or two in, like within their borders to being able to like, utilize that for hydropower, but it's far harder to get them to literally build and then run an entire nuclear power plant. But the next thing I wanna talk about, and this is really important, is what happens with nuclear waste in a firm as well, what happens right now with nuclear waste. So, when nuclear waste is stored in developed countries who rely on nuclear power, they store it in spaces which belong to vulnerable communities. 
I will be very annoying here and provide you with exclusively an Australian example, which is that we have two nuclear waste disposal sites in Australia, and they both sit on Indigenous sacred land. That is what happens when developed, country, community, when developed countries choose to house their nuclear waste. That is obviously really harmful. You render those lands untenable and unusable by those Indigenous populations. That's really bad. Noting here the obvious comparison is none of that happens with any form of renewable energy. But the third thing I will tell you is what is even more likely is when developed countries switch to nuclear and they have nuclear waste, what do they do? They don't house it on shore, they exploit in the developing country, they make them court, like, store their nuclear waste. And when eventually it breaks down, as sometimes it does, that has an enormous, enormous harm on the lives of very, very vulnerable people. That is a harm that affirmative can never come over because that is a harm that literally just does not exist in our world and the, the potential harm it causes in their world is so huge. Look at disasters like Chernobyl, but look at what happens when the US has a nuclear waste drone disintegrate in the Pacific and young children on Pacific Island start eating nuclear waste because they find it in the water. That is what happens in a famine's world that never happens in our world. Unfortunately, this negative team operates in the status quo, and that status quo is the status quo that is sinking. It is the status quo that is on fire. It is the status quo that is suffering from blistering heat waves. It is the status quo that is decades away from irreversible tipping points. It is the status quo under which the, the case for renewables have largely failed. The giant hole at the center of this negative team's case is the way they characterize the renewable renewables effectiveness and renewables adoption. And I think you know you need to look no further than to look at their own examples to show how deeply they misunderstand what is required to avert the worst Im scenario imaginable. They talk about taking easy wins and free kicks, convincing people to put solar panels on top of their house. Try convincing a government to re-electrify its entire grid so that every household can store enough solar energy to run their house. This is not a debate about individual actions, about individual access to renewables. It is a debate about whether we are able to avert the worst impending doom by using the resources that we have available, or whether the people who have the one mandate to help us will continue to stick their heads in the sand and stick their heads in fear and betray us. We at Stanford Environmentalist Movement that looks at the tools that we have available to solve this problem, they stand for an environmentalist movement that continues to cower away from this problem. Let's firstly explain the effectiveness and credibility of this movement and of this message. Then I will explain why exactly it is the case that we need nuclear so badly. What are their claims as to the effectiveness and credibility of a movement? They set up their framing for this debate in a way that is so ridiculously uncomparative. They tell us, well, you can only convince people to decarbonize when you can prove that it is quick, cheap, and reliable, none of which apply to even the most credible sources of renewables right now. It is not quick. It is not to say that you can use infrastructure that you already have, because unlike being able to pump out a constant stream of power that economies and countries are prepared to deal with and have been operating off of since industrialization and electrification began, you have to redesign enormous system, uh, systems around it. It is not cheap because maybe putting a solar panel on top of your house if you live in Australia is cheap, but building an entire hydroelectric plant that is capable of sustaining a country is also not cheap. It's also not reliable, and even if you think that some of these things are reliable in theory, they are also not trusted to be reliable, which is why, despite decades of activism and advocacy like you know, begging countries to switch to renewables, presenting the case 
case, they have not done so in an overwhelming majority of instances. The second claim they make is that this is deeply politically unpopular. We preempt this already when we describe it that at the places where it is most acutely politically unpopular are relatively specific. That is to say, if you have suffered a nuclear disaster in your country, one, this is a heavily prioritized debate. It is actually unclear to me why we have to go to Japan and push the worst, uh, worst and most heavy-handed form of pro-nuclear message imagin imaginable. They are not that big a polluter in the grand scheme of things. Anyway, but secondly, it is used around the world already. This team is so a factual in their understanding of nuclear's role. China has world-class nuclear technology that they continue to roll out all the time. India has nuclear energy as its fifth largest source of energy already. The United States has nuclear energy that eclipses in output every single source of renewables that exists at the status quo. Hydroelectric, solar, wind, that is the world that we live in. The reason that those plants close, the reason that those plants do not get opened when they should, that that concrete does not get put in the ground, we do not break ground on new nuclear power plants, we do not fund research into thorium batteries or diffusion energy, is because of fear, is because of, of movements that betray people and their own best interests. What exactly do we tell you? We tell you that firstly, the environmentalist movement actually honestly needs this for its credibility because many places already use it, many places cannot roll out renewables in the same way that they could roll out nuclear for reasons that are already explained. That is the world that we live in. So when you approach India and you approach China, who are already very happy to use nuclear, and you demand that they stop, which is often what environmentalists do, and you demand that they do something that they already perceive in their revealed preference to be less efficient than the thing that they are doing now, that is the moment that they don't give a shit what the environmentalist movement says. They say, I don't want to decarbonize my economy in a way that would plunge hundreds of millions of people back into the poverty that I have single-handedly lifted them out of. And honestly, fair enough, that is the moment that the environmentalist movement looks like a bunch of Western idiots who like who point to a handful of disasters as a reason that we should not use one of the best, most efficient forms of energy that there is. Secondly, we explain that this advocacy is likely to be very effective for the reasons that environmental advocacy is often effective. That is to say, you can uh, like that for the reason that the movement is effective in doing anything. That is to say, you can move capital, yeah, and that does not just look like fucking Greenpeace. It looks like the Climate 200. It looks like philanthropist groups. It looks like non-governmental organizations. It looks like various development funds that focus on that. Secondly, it looks like the changing of people's minds. Like oh, honestly, guys, a lot of the fear around nuclear energy was created by the environmentalist movement, and it is a damn shame that they did so. They can change these people's minds again, especially given the demographic changes that we explained to you at Mayor. The lots of people have not lived through a nuclear disaster now. Lots of people are worried about what is the existential threat of this generation, which is the climate crisis, rather than the existential threat of the Cold War and of that area, which was which was nuclear. That is no longer the monster. We have a new monster. We have a new monster, and the enemy of my enemy in this instance is in fact my friend. Second, we explain that the reasons that you can appeal, you can appeal to governments are particularly persuasive. This is not about like random tiny developing nations nuclearizing to insulate them, themselves from their economy. It's literally appealing to the United the United States sense of xenophobia and sense of foreign policy to say, hey, wouldn't you love to be less dependent on shiny on the, like on Chinese lithium? Wouldn't you love to be less dependent on bauxite? Wouldn't you love to be less dependent on all of these minerals that like, exist in supply chains that you often struggle to compete with and struggle to control? Wouldn't you like to not be reliant on oil? Wouldn't you like to not have to frack in your own country, which is even more politically unpopular than that is the kind of messaging that you can appeal to. That is why it's likely to be very effective. Let's secondly explain why we need nuclear. What are their claims? They say that well, that we can't afford nuclear because it uses enormous amounts of water. Yeah, one only model, one model of reactor does this. Two, yeah, seawater. You're drinking that. Third, yeah, water you can reuse and run through the reactor again and again and again. Unclear, like what else you're using that for? That point. They secondly say, well, it uses non-renewable components and fracking is bad. Cool. So does renewable energy. It is not enough to build a, to build a wind farm. It is not enough to build a solar panel. You have to build a battery to store that energy for when you can use it later, which is also non renewable, which is also far, which is also mined in the worst places. They lastly explain that it requires like uh, an enormous amount of infrastructure in order to support. They have this the entire wrong way round. When you have a power plant that is hooked up to a grid, it does not matter if that power plant is burning coal or if it is producing nuclear energy. It can connect to the grid all the same. You don't need to rewire an entire country. You don't need to put a battery at very stroke points. You need to put a battery in people's homes. Like what do, what do we say? We say that this is a proven technology. It works. It is clean. We are good at disposing of the waste. We say it is highly improvable, unlike solar and wind and, like, and hydroelectric, which each individual technology does not have that much more scope for efficiency and improvement. We thirdly say that it is far more powerful.
which is why countries continue to use it. There's so much more potential energy in the splitting of a single atom than there is in the wind that you can collect on a, on a day or in the sun on a day. And we fourthly say that it is far more predictable, both in the supply and the, produ uh, and the production. No, this is a lame mechanism for our environmental day debates, but like honestly, it, like not having as much UV, UV activity is something that really impacts solar. Not having as much wind as you predicted, as for instance, weather patterns become more unpredictable, is really the, is a really bad thing for collecting that energy. And we explain that the source is extremely predictable. You don't need to worry about, for instance, obtaining batteries from another country. You don't need to worry about cooperation in that, re in that respect. Yes, building a nuclear power plant was expensive, but we didn't do things because they were easy. We did things because they, would ha they were hard and they would save our lives. They would save the lives of everyone in this room. They would save the lives of the people in Jakarta who are sinking into the ocean. They would save the lives of Pacific Islanders who would be underwater otherwise. This team never proves why any of these sources can do anything close to what nuclear can do. It was absolutely immorally bankrupt for this team to go against it. So proud to have fun. says that convincing governments is really hard, but I think you need to be comparative because they never explain how they're able to convince governments to change to nuclear when it takes massive buy-in. We're talking about billions of dollars, massive infrastructure, noting when you compare renewables, which already noting we have a lot of pre-existing infrastructure, but even at the point at which we did it, that required far less capital to buy-in and governments were already apprehensive to do that, and it's taken the environmental movement decades to convince governments to do this. Unclear how this team actually gets that. I think the affirmative team loses this debate on the metric they rely on heavy, heavily prioritization being effective without actually proving how they get this buy-in. When we already are winning on the metric of explaining this is extremely politically unpopular, governments probably just don't support it. What am I going to do in this speech? Firstly, I'm going to do some way which will be really important to explain why we get buy-in from three stakeholders. Then I'm going to do some additional analysis on the comparative and look at the risks, which is the harms that they have on their side. First thing they say is that they already have China and India because nuclear energy exists in those contexts. Even if this team can claim China, they cannot win in the vast majority of the debate because the contention in this characterization is that they try to conceive of this debate quite narrowly by explaining that, well, India and China already do it, so that is a win condition for them. I think the delta for this debate is where the more re reasonable characterization occurs because, sure, maybe they have to push for this in Japan, but if they already have China, it's just unclear what the delta is. I think the vast majority of countries we are actually talking about are the ones where they don't have nuclear yet or they have quite minimal infrastructure, even in their best case, because otherwise it's just unclear like what their benefit is if they already have the infrastructure and the countries are already doing it. I don't think that's a particularly strategic choice from this team. Who do we get buy-in from on side negative then? I think we get buy-in from three very important stakeholders. Firstly, conservatives. Firstly, I think conservatives prefer our world far more because there is less of an initial upfront cost. And secondly, I think they would prefer a world where there is less additional infrastructure required to be built because obviously conservatives are often more fiscally conservative and in their world they have to do far more expenditure and far more financial output to get the kind of infrastructure that they require. But thirdly and most importantly, I think there are very specific electoral incentives which mean the politicians probably don't want to do this because firstly we explained to you at Georgia to no response from this affirmative team that the people who work in these plants and build them are really unhappy because it is dangerous and risky work. But secondly, we explain to you that environmentalists obviously are really unhappy with this because this is like something that they've advocated for against for decades, obviously very much against their interest. But the second group of stakeholders that I think we get buy-in from on our side, which is particularly important, is developing nations. Firstly, infrastructure is far more accessible in our world because often these things already exist. Like for example, in like 
like Botswana, if they want hydroelectricity, they need to build a dam. That was far more reasonable for them to build, or perhaps in our best case, already existed. In their world, like those countries can't even do the initial buy-in to build the infrastructure. That obviously meant they were completely locked out under their side. But secondly, often we explain to you again, to no response, that these plans are often built in developing nations or even in the developed world on indigenous land, which was especially harmful because that meant that their lands were eroded and destroyed, their connection to country was destroyed, and that is a particularly vulnerable stakeholder in this debate that I think you ought to care about. But thirdly, we explain to you that the environmental degradation is terrible, as is conceded at first affirmative. Obviously, this is bad for developing nations in particular, and the mechanism for this here is that often in developing nations, they rely a lot on their land and the sustainability of their land because they rely on industries like agriculture or like, like, or they have to like do like, you know, like, like, I don't know, they rely on agriculture. Obviously, at the point at which you choose a form of like, like of nuclear power that is far less sustainable for your land, when you poison the waters and erode the soil, you actually can't use that land. That had terrible economic harms for those developing nations. That was particularly bad. But I think the third group that we get, and I just don't think affirmative wins on this metric, is progressives. Because firstly, this probably leads to splintering in the environmental movement, which was really bad. Because when you are splintered, your activism is less meaningful and less powerful. It meant that you had less bodies on the ground supporting you at your rallies or lobbying against your government. That obviously was far worse. And because the environmental movement has always <clears throat> relied very heavily on its ability to do lots of activism by having bodies on the ground, at the point at which you have less support broadly, that was really harmful because that meant you could do less activism. Which brings me to my second point, which is that you lose massive capital, which obviously was really terrible. And the third thing I say is this team says, ah, oh, they have weaponized the fear of nuclear energy. And that is a win for us because that means under their side, the environmental movement loses massive amounts of credibility because they spent decades explaining why nuclear energy is terrible, why it's bad for the environment, bad for the lives of individuals who live in countries where this is being built. That therefore means under their side, a movement that has already fought for decades to try and get agency and mobility actually loses their credibility. That means, and that is where our material on buying becomes things like, ah, oh, the environmental movement is stupid, they don't even know what they want. So that is where you get the splintering in the movement because now progressives are torn over what to do. That was a massive harm for them. I think that loses them this debate. So at the end of that issue, I think what you have to believe is that you need to weigh <clears throat> because at the point at which this team already has buying in countries like China and India, as I explained, that is not where the delta for this debate is. What you need to care about more is the countries where we don't already have. They never get buy-in from those countries and the stakeholders that I explained that were particularly important. Buy-in was the most important metric in this debate because if you cannot get buy-in, you cannot get capital. That means you do not do things like do good regulations or build the plants well. That was massively harmful under their side. Now I want to do some additional analysis on the comparative because they explained that renewables require that renewable, sorry, nuclear is renewable, um, and the mechanism here is that batteries require a lot of lithium. But firstly, nuclear plants require just far more lithium and far more uranium and other raw materials that are terrible for extraction. Like, they just have to build massive reactors. Like, obviously they have to do far more of the bad thing under their side. But secondly, even if you think the harms of extraction of lithium are like, to an extent, symmetrical to be charitable to this team. In our world, we obviously just prop things like hydro or other forms of renewables where we think the harm scales down. Like, that's probably fine. But then they can see that renewables where, like, the focus... Like, the focus on renewables was often due to the political downfalls of nuclear. And this relates back to the credibility argument, which is that, like, this is still true. People are still scared of Chernobyl. They're scared of Fukushima. They're still scared of nuclear. It is highly politically unpopular. We never get a sufficient response to that framing. Obviously, at the end of that, then, I think we still win on the metric of being more sustainable and obviously, like, um, renewables be being far better for the environment. But... Even if at their best case you're willing to believe the harms of things like extraction are somewhat symmetrical, we still win on this metric because that is mitigation at best. That is not a win condition for this team. They cannot win by mitigating our argument. Finally, let's look at the risks then. They explain that climate change is bad, and this is true. The reason that this is really important is that they're proposing something that takes 10 years to build, and we've been told that we have 10 years to fix climate change. Literally, under their side, far, far worse for climate change because we have to wait two decades for infrastructure to be built. At that point, Pacific Island nations have already gone underwater. Literally, that loses them the debate because that was far worse. We also explained to you that nuclear plants 
are extremely susceptible to volatile weather. And obviously when climate change gets worse, the rate at which they're subject to like things like bushfires or flooding is far worse. So what you need to believe is not only were these plants more risky, it was terrible for climate change, which is the wind condition they set for themselves. They explain they want to solve climate change. They are the team that is far worse for climate change because they're going to take 10 years to build that plant. We only have 10 years left. You obviously have to vote side negative. In order for this team to win the debate, they require you to believe that the environmental movement would do such a bad job at effectively advocating. Let's imagine the topic was that the LGBT movement should advocate for drag. The only way in which side negative takes this debate is that they say, well, drag isn't popular in countries like Serbia because they're deeply homophobic. That was the sort of stance that meant that you're not going to actually win this debate on side negative because you focus on the most deeply ineffective forms of advocacy. We've proven to you down the bench the way in which the environment is likely to act is within its interest, is within a way in which it can make a proper change and actually lead to effective decarbonisation. Don't believe all of their bullshit and bluster about why you're likely to get a politically unpopular movement. Don't believe it, it's just such crap. Two things in this speech. Firstly, on efficient advocacy. Secondly, on efficient carbonisation. But I'm going to start by talking about efficient advocacy because this is literally the only way in which side negative can take this debate. What are their claims on why this is politically unpopular? They are threefold. The first one is that there is a backdrop of nuclear disaster, which means it's really unpopular for you to do this sort of thing. Four responses. Firstly, these nuclear disasters were a long time ago. Living generations right now do not remember Chernobyl, they do not remember incidents such as Fukushima, so these things are disappearing from a public conscious as time goes on. Secondly, there is a revealed preference from nuclear power movements to not care about the past and also from the public to not care about the past. Even though Fukushima happened five years after that, the EU then upstarted its nuclear program once again and increased the extent to which it was building those things. Clearly, these countries and movements do not care about that past, so it's not something that you ought to weigh. Thirdly, though, we explain to you that because the environmental movement can do a good job of its advocacy, then you're likely to simply explain away the errors of the past in an efficient way. Because you can say that Chernobyl was because of shonky Soviet architecture. You can say that Fukushima was because it was built on a fault line. Those were the sorts of things that meant that you were not going to be able to explain away all these past issues of the, of the past. Finally, it, the reason that this like backdrop of nuclear like disaster thing is like it salient within the movement right now is because the environmental movement chooses to make it salient in the movement right now. To the extent that we stop demonizing nuclear power, that is something that means that you no longer actually focus on these things at the very first instance. The backdrop of nuclear power loses. The second thing that we say is the good push that Trinity has, love you Trinity, which is that conservatives are not going to like this because it costs a lot of money and it takes a lot of time to set up, build a plant, build land and store these sorts of things. But 
be comparative because this also takes a lot of time and a lot of land to set up. Uh, you know, on other when you have other forms of energy that you're advocating for, right? Because for solar, you need to spread every single panel out along the ground very thinly. That takes way many, like way much more land than it does to build a singular building. You need so much space to build a solar plant. It is so expensive to do things like build solar because you have to buy up all that land, but then you also have to buy all of the chips and batteries that you need to be able to deploy that effectively across everybody. No, when you have things like solar, you're hampered by the ability, by the ability to store that. You have to pay for batteries to be widely accessible to the people. That is not something that can happen. Finally though, uh, when you have uh, the technologies that they're relying on, things like solar, it's just contingent on the individual characteristics of that area, which is a, which is a process that nuclear energy surpasses because when you have a tree next to your home, you cannot have a solar panel because there is shade that is on your house. That is why my house doesn't have a solar panel because we have a tree next to it. When you have, when you live in a not windy area, you can't build wind farms in those areas because of the fact that there is no wind to power those farms. Nuclear waste, uh, nuclear energy surpasses all these things so effectively. So that conservative thing about like, you know, it takes a lot of money doesn't actually apply. Because conservatives are probably also pretty mad at other forms of like, you know, renewable energy advocacy. The final thing that they tell you is that you lose progressives because progressives are now splintered out because some progressives used to not like nuclear uh, and, you know, now they're a bit sad about it. But think about the reason that progressives are splintered on the, like, you know, nuclear advocacy. It is because the wind movement has not taken a stance in support of nuclear advocacy to the extent that the, that the environmental movement is now supporting this sort of thing. And progressives tend to, like, you know, the most forefront progressive versions of those movements that are actually advocating for change. Progressives are likely to change their mind because they're going to believe the advocacy of the environmental movement. So you don't get that splintering because the environmental movement is no longer demonizing nuclear energy. At the end of this, don't believe that you get inefficient advocacy Believe all the structural mechanization that you get down the bench at Connor and Mayer as to why this is likely to work and as to why you're likely to get a good form of advocacy that can actually make change. So that was why we win this debate because we knock them out and it, that we are so logically prior to them because we can explain to you that you actually get that change at the very first instance. Things like solar have run their time. It is no longer a popular thing because of the fact that those movements are ones that have exhausted the power of those things. You, are, you, can, you should now move on to a better version that can actually create the change that you want to make. Now, now let's talk about efficient decarbonization and which side is better at achieving that. So what did we tell you down the bench? We told you this was way better than any other form of than, than any other form of art uh, of uh, uh of decarbonization for the reason, firstly, that it is much more efficient than alternatives because it is entirely zero emissions. Secondly, though, it can be accessed on demand because it is a plant as opposed to an individual farm or an individual, uh, you know, or, or an individual like you know, uh, like wind area. It's not hampered by things like a cloudy day or things by unfavorable tides. Thirdly, though, it doesn't require batteries like other forms of renewables. And fourthly, we have the scope to make this a, a much better ability and a much better alternative than other forms. Trinity, uh, Trinity and Georgia say, well, this is only speculative, but obviously like all research that we don't know right now is speculative. The problem is that we tell you that under our bench, you're more likely to access that speculation, more likely to get the research that you need to access those sorts of things. What are their claims then on our decarbonization and why it's ineffective? The first is to say that storage is really inefficient. You're likely to do things like, you know, store it poorly and it's gonna lead to waste, or you're gonna ship it off to developing countries or put it on indigenous land. Three layers of response. Firstly, we hugely evolve the way in which we store nuclear uh, waste over time. Because you can now do things like put it into concrete bunkers that are five meters under the ground, which means that it never touches or interacts with a single human soul. So that is actually really efficient forms of storage. Secondly, you're not going to ship this off to developing countries or put on indigenous land because there are international waste disposal treaties that stop this sort of thing from happening. The structural reason as to why these treaties exist is because states are perceived to have to internalize their own activities the externalities of them. So you're, not, you're unlikely to ship this off. Don't believe or like that crap. Connor does international law. You ought to believe this. Thirdly, though, uh, this argument about like in, about indigenous uh, about putting it like you know uh, on indigenous land or shipping off to developing countries uh, is just deeply unlikely to eventuate once the environmental movement actually starts advocating for it. Because that is a movement that is uh, you know relatively progressive and actually cares about those about those environments about those indigenous people in the first place or cares about not fucking over developing countries. So to that extent, now the environmental movement isn't. Involved, they're not going to want to act in particularly egregious ways towards these countries. But fourthly, even if you believe that we're putting it on indigenous land and those people are losing the connection to their land, I'm so sorry, but you just have to outweigh the impacts on indigenous people. The impact that this has on the climate, on the climate movement writ large and on decarbonization writ large is so much more important. 
The next thing that they say is that, well, if we're only targeting countries like our China, India, the US, and you know, and the EU and stuff like that, and not targeting countries like Japan, then where are we actually getting the delta in this space? Uh, firstly, this can see that nuclear energy is good because it's telling us that we actually should have, you know, some sort of delta. But secondly, the delta is very obvious. The delta is that, you know, you're going from a 5% state of, you know, uh, nuclear energy within the US to being, it being like 50 and to replacing our current coal burning plants with nuclear plants. That is a delta, it is quite obvious. The next thing that they say is that, well, we're actually not being very climate time sensitive uh, because it takes a long time to build. Firstly, it's just an assertion that it takes a long time to build. Secondly, big comparative, so do hydroelectric dams and hydro farms. The space isn't one or lost on, you know, who can better get there in the next 10 years. Obviously, that was unimportant. The final thing that they say is that nuclear plants are susceptible to weather. No, they're susceptible to earthquakes. They're not susceptible to weather. Every single other form of energy under their side of the house. At the end of this debate, believe side affirmative and vote side affirmative because we are much more reasonable. We actually get to you the advocacy and the decarbonization that the world needs right now so that we don't all melt and sink. Uh, I think the affirmative or the negative. Maybe this team could win this debate if this was a debate that was like, oh, the government should implement nuclear energy. But it is not. This is about the environmental movement advocating for nuclear energy and then how, somehow having the government implement it. They cannot win this debate unless they prove to you that the government can act, is actually going to respond to this and go, ah, well, we will implement nuclear energy. The important thing to note, and what we tell you from the start of this debate, is that the US is literally closing down its nuclear power plants. What does it do when the, the environmental movement, who for years and years and years has literally been like, you shouldn't use nuclear energy, now goes, oh, guys, sorry, mistake, you actually should use nuclear energy. Do they listen? No, because the reason they were closing down their plants is because they are so incredibly expensive to run. The reason why they then don't listen to the environmental movement is because they're like, guys, what on earth? You've been doing this the whole time. You obviously don't have any credibility as a movement because obviously at the point at which you change your entire stance or something, a movement just inevitably loses credibility. That was terrible for Biden, and it was terrible for governments to actually believe anything about what you said in the long term. They tell you at the beginning of Branko's speech that we can only win if we prove that like uh, environmental advocacy is done so badly. But obviously that is not true. Obviously environmental advocacy can be done as well as they want. That does not mitigate or change the fact that uh, like, uh, so, uh, sorry, nuclear power is incredibly expensive and a, politi a very politically unpopular thing to do. So let's talk about the fact of why nuclear power is so incredibly expensive and therefore you don't actually get, I guess, the support from conservatives, etc. They try to suggest that, oh, well, this is actually not the case because obviously things like solar, etc., are also just as expensive. Firstly, just empirically untrue because solar power does not necessarily have make you do the things of massive waste storage that occurs because they tell you you have to do it massively underground. That is something that just does take a lot of money. Secondly, the creation of these plants is far more expensive than the creation of those grids. You have to accept, like, buy far more land, 
they, like they tell you, oh, solar power takes up more space. No, because in nuclear power plants, you have to have these areas of safety around them. That takes up far more space than solar power, power does. So you do have to buy up far more land to be able to put these things on. But secondly, obviously things, for example, like the distribution methods were far worse because you have to spend so much more on safety measures for these plants. Those are things that could, those stops costs could never be, uh, could never be sick skipped. And also, thirdly, obviously the fact that you then have to do waste storage is obviously far more expensive. You never have to do that with solar, you never have to do that with hydroelectricity. But the final thing we also tell you here of why this is so expensive is the fact that developing countries literally cannot just do these upfront costs for this infrastructure. We never get a response to the fact that we literally tell you the places, like a lot of these developing countries already have things like dams and so therefore it's far more easy for them to just put in place things like hydroelectricity on them. That is obviously things that those developing countries are able to do in a far better way as opposed to like the ridiculous output costs that occur at the beginning for doing nuclear energy. That is to explain therefore that nuclear energy is so ridiculously expensive and therefore governments just do not want to implement this because it is far, far worse I guess for them electorally. The second thing we explain why this is so bad, I guess, electorally, is because of the fact that, uh, I guess, people find this like, extremely, I guess, terrifying in terms of safety. They go, oh, well, we'll just dispel these myths and things like, these things happened so long ago. No, Fukushima happened in 2011. This is not something that people just forget. Obviously, things like massive disasters which killed thousands of people and all these people just like go, oh, well, I guess that just isn't important anymore. Most people have emotional responses to these things and are terrified of them happening to them. The second thing we explain, though, is obviously actually some of these risks just do occur, which is why you have to have massive safety implementations. They go, it's only earthquakes that do, uh, like, that uh, impact them. No, it's not. Things like flooding and bushfires are literally things that do just massively impact them because you, uh, like, ruin the safety mechanisms that you already had in place at those nuclear plants. Those are risks that people can't. And even if you could explain, like, this whole idea of, oh, this just isn't as bad, people have far more emotional connection to the fact that they have seen the fact that lives have been lost. It doesn't matter if an environmental, like, white person gets up and is like, don't you worry, guys, it's all just fine. People far more respond to the fact that, like, death just has occurred to these things and therefore it is incredibly unsafe. That is obviously something, therefore, it's very unclear why you do get, I guess, more buy-in from people in the first place. The third thing they say is, well, governments will like this because it's onshore energy. Firstly, that's not exclusive to nuclear power. Obviously, that is not something, like, we can obviously support that with things like solar power, wind power, etc. Those are things that obviously can occur onshore and outward, so I don't think you get them there in that place, etc. But the second thing we also explain, uh, you have to probably just, like, weigh this against the fact that you, like, a massive flip in terms of losing credibility is obviously really terrible for the movement. That also means you get just less buy-in from people within the environmental movement, and that's something that's particularly that because obviously we need everyone advocating for it. If you're a person who lives somewhere where a nuclear plant might be built, you're not ever going to then go out again and like advocate for the environmental movement because obviously having a nuclear power plant near you literally creates massive fuck tons of dust that may impact you terribly. That is not something you therefore want to advocate for because you're annoyed that the environmental movement is literally ruining your livelihood. That is obviously something that's bad. Second thing, therefore, I'm going to explain is why governments never do, I guess, like implement this. I guess their only response here is to explain, oh, well, nuclear power is already, I guess, like big in, in all these countries and so therefore like, I guess it's not as expensive, etc. Firstly, unclear then why you would need to prioritise in these countries. But secondly, they are literally, like, because you'd have to show that there was some change in the nuclear power that you were getting and we already tell you that developing countries can't put these upfront costs so they're therefore not going to be the ones to be able to change. Obviously they'll have to prove that these developed countries also get far more, like, I guess, people coming in and making more nuclear power plants. But they obviously don't because they've just showed a preference to closing them down because of the fact that they are so ridiculously expensive to run. Obviously, so obviously for that prioritised expectation to be effective, they would have to have more plants. They obviously don't do it. But the second thing, I guess, that they explain is they go, they're like, I think the second thing to explain is obviously developing countries never do prioritise this, which is obviously why we wanted more nuclear power plants, even if it's true that I guess other places have nuclear power plants, because the waste always ends up in their countries. They don't want this waste in their countries. We tell you this from first, but it gets zero response. That is obviously something that developing countries, therefore, would never ever want to actually do in the first place. That is incredibly, incredibly bad. So, I think what you should believe at the end, at the end of this first thing is that the governments do not put in place things that are politically unpopular and that make people terrified. They do not put in place things that are extremely, extraordinarily expensive and far worse to build. Obviously things like solar and things can be used from existing things. Also individuals can also upfront this cost, especially in developed countries. People can put solar plows, plants in the house. Franco points to a series of increasing kind of like odd and like quite small ranges of things where like solar power can't be used. Okay, maybe some people have tree next to their house. That's literally just not everyone. Obviously some people just can put solar power plants in their house and obviously countries just do have wind that they're able to use for things like uh, like wind farms. That's so incredibly unclear. Even if you believe that some people can't do this, obviously the vast majority of cases 
can do this. We also point to things like, ele like hydroelectricity, geothermal energy, things that literally just can be used anywhere. That is like that series of things of like where it just can't be used is not something that takes away from the fact that obviously there are a broad range of energy and we are also able to prioritize specifically what countries would be able to use best types of energy for them and their specific circumstances. They can't do that because they heavily prioritize nuclear energy in all forms of advocacy. That is incredibly bad. The final thing, I guess, uh, that is important to it, uh, sorry, the final thing, I guess, uh, that is important to explain at, at the best, uh, sorry, at the end of this also, is that they, we also just get quite a clear win when we explain to you that nuclear power takes far, far longer to build. Because they literally tell you that the status quo is bad, that it is impending and we only have 10 years. So we do not have time to therefore wait to build more nuclear power plants, which is the only way they'd be able to win this debate, right, is if you were going to be able to build more power plants. So even in their best case scenario, where governments listen to you and they're able to build more power plants, what happens? You have to wait 10 years for that power plant to open. By the time that occurs, that is no longer something that is incredibly effective for climate change. They tell you, oh, it's just an assertion that power plants take a long time to build. No, it's not. We literally told you at Georgia all the reasons why this is the case. Firstly, because there is massive safety risks, so you do just have to take longer to be able to build them. You have to be able to buy considerable amounts of land to be able to put them in place. Reactors take a long time to actually create. All of those sorts of things are things that do it. Frankly, it's not one on who gets it in 10 years, but it obviously is because the environmental movement cares about fixing climate change. Obviously, we wanted something that was able to fix it. Now, we had all the infrastructure for things like solar power, etc. The only thing they can rely on is the fact maybe in a couple of years you get more research on these things, but that was A, speculative, and B, obviously all the things I talked to about research are things that have already been researched, so I don't, it's unclear as to what be better research benefits they get in the long term in terms of creating better nuclear power. Obviously, we were able to get none of these risks when we focused on things like renewable energy that did not have to be stored on indigenous land, etc. Those were things that obviously was far better in our when you should have not massive risks, and obviously governments were far more able to support things that actually had that were actually politically popular, and the environmental movement had already had increasing support for and had already gotten change from. Thank you. through which you should assess this debate and the arguments presented to you from side of that. The first is whether or not nuclear is something that the environmental movement should be pushing for, and the second is whether or not advocacy for nuclear um, results in its actual implementation. And note that side of Ferman must win on both of these metrics for them to win this debate. What do we tell you on the first? The first argument, so the first a metric for side affirmative is whether or not nuclear just is something that is in the interest of the environmental movement that they should be advocating for. What do we tell you and why don't why aren't they able to win this clash? First thing we tell you is that nuclear is a far less renewable source of energy than alternatives such as solar and wind and hydro. I would note that I think at times the responses we hear from side affirmative are particularly uncharitable when they seem to continue to be referencing fossil fuels, but obviously we are talking about a debate of like what the environmental movement is advocating for, and in our world they like heavily prioritizing the advocacy of renewables. So like be comparative here, it is not about like coal power plants, it is about advocating things like solar and wind and hydro. The second thing we tell you, though, is that the environmental movement fractures deeply in their world. And I think they can see this when they tell you that there are places they wouldn't bother heavily prioritising this research or oh, oh, this activism. And then they tell you that they would heavily prioritise it in places like India and China, where they then tell you already have nuclear power. Which is to say that I think what we hear from side affirmative is that where they are not going to bother advocating in places that do not have nuclear power, hence they get zero change, and then they go advocate in places that do have nuclear power, where for the record panel, they also therefore get zero change in benefit, right? <laughs> what do we tell you? We tell you that advocacy for renewables is always going to be far better. We tell you that advocacy for nuclear power is particularly politically unpopular. We also tell you that always disadvantages developing countries and minority communities. I think at best their response to this material is mitigatory. I think at times they are missing. And I think what you have to believe at the end of that clash is it's always going to be far easier, but also just far more like holistic and um, like unifying for the um, 
for the environmental movement to push for renewables and have prioritized them in terms of their advocacy. So, but even if you don't believe that we win on this metric, why do we still, we still win the debate on the second metric, which is to say that advocacy for nuclear does not, which they want to talk about in their case, does not result in its actual implementation. And this is where I think the affirmative team have not done enough to prove, to prove this to you in this debate, because what do we tell you? We tell you nuclear is politically unpopular. They tell you you can explain away things like Chernobyl or Fukushima, but hear me out, you do not have to explain away the harms of solar, or you don't have to explain the way harms of a wind farm. So like, be comparative, who is going to have, who has the hardest sell here to the average person? Obviously it is side affirmative, obviously that is far, far harder than to claim in this debate. Because there is just a reasonable fear of nuclear disaster for the average person, to the point where even if I, even if you manage to convince the most people of like the broad scientific, like maybe it's a good idea there, I'm still gonna tell you I don't want my government putting one on my street or in my city or in my like country, I would far rather they are far further away. And the important thing to note there is that just, we tell you this from first, first of all, it doesn't get a response, but it's really important because this is to say that no matter how hard the environmental movement pushes, and no matter how much people are happy with this, with um with nuclear as a conception, it will never actually materialize in the community, which means they never get to claim those benefits of nuclear power. At the point where they can't do that and they have to rely on some other form of energy, we tell you if the environmental movement has spent their time prioritizing things like renewables, then we at least get that good energy in our world. That is a huge positive. But the other thing we tell you is it will never manifest in their world because of the enormous expense. And again, just be comparative here. Solar panels and wind farms and hydro are not as expensive, but also we offer you the specific metric that they are far more accessible in developing communities because of the fact that they often have some of the infrastructure there already. So like we just give you the example of like dams and hydro and, and like and um and therefore the ability to implement hydro fairly reasonably. That means that the side of Furman also do not win on the second metric of this debate, which is to say they do not prove that the advocacy they want to push for ever gets implementation. But even if you believe that rhetoric, what does this debate come down to? As they identify, climate change is a massive problem and we need change today. And their very base, best case scenario, they get you a benefit in 20 years, we get you a benefit tomorrow, vote negative. <laughs> ask where the side affirmative meets it. And the reason I'm starting with establishing what the burden of this debate is, is because I think this is the quickest way that negative loses the debate, because they so egregiously mis and misunderstand and misrepresent it. For all they talk about a 10 year timeline and switching to solar and getting change tomorrow, no one is operating on that timeline. What do you have to do? And the metric of this debate is who can replace fossil fuels, not who can put solar panels on residential buildings that cannot power anything beyond those buildings. You have to power whole countries with distributable energy because that is how it works right now and what they have the infrastructure to do, what they have the need for. You have to power the industries that keep people out of poverty, you cannot put a single solar panel on the roof of a factory. You have to be able to do that relatively soon. And this is really, really important because it means that there's a giant analytical gap in this, negative, in this negative case. They needed to prove that renewables could actually do this in the way that they exist right now. And we give you plenty of reasons down, to the, down the bench to, to make you believe that they can't. They secondly needed to prove that environmentalists can convince states that renewables are capable of doing this despite their revealed preference and much of their analysis shoots them in the face here because they tell you that you do not need to explain away the, uh, the harms of solar panels. Yeah, you need to explain the benefits of solar panels to states that have a revealed preference to have nuclear power eclipse all of their other sources of renewable energies within their, their borders. Neither of which they do. Neither of which they do. The rest of their material is so silly and so symmetric. They say, "Ah, oh, well, India already has uh, already has so uh, already has some nuclear energy, so we couldn't have any more of it." They say, "Ah, oh, the nuclear the U.S. currently in its priorities is closing some new, so a few power plants, like we couldn't convince them to do otherwise, or if it was more politically salient, they wouldn't do otherwise." Come on, we would like nuclear energy to not be the fifth largest source of power in, in India. We would like it to be the third or the second, because that is what reduces emissions from the worst emitting countries in the world. This team thinks this debate applies to Japan and very confusingly Botswana, that is not where this debate occurs. It occurs in the largest polluters, it occurs in the largest economies, 
it, you do not get a just one, which is why you cannot convince countries to do it. Let's secondly ask the question of whether we meet this burden. Let's ask, can nuclear do this? We tell you that this is proven technology, we know how to deal with it, we know what it's capable of. We secondly tell you that it's incredibly powerful, which cuts the expense and land and, land, and all of the bluster that this team throws at us to suggest that Seoul baselessly, with no structural reasons other than to say, we have it now, so it must be cheaper. Uh, and, second, and thirdly, it is just overall cheaper. Nuclear reactor power plants are built of steel and concrete and lead and uranium versus solar plants, which they need, because remember, they need to power entire countries, which are built of chips and solar cells and batteries that use rare minerals that are dug out of the ground. Second, can we convince governments of this? We remove, firstly, the heat, much of the heat that makes this politically unpopular in the first place. They, these guys take the cheap shot and saying, well, it's bad for movements to backflip. I, okay, I guess it's bad for movements to change their mind. It's bad for movements to switch pri priorities. Come on, guys, they can do this reasonably well. They would give you reasons down the bench to believe that they can. They can say the climate crisis is now impending. We should turn to this source, this tool that we already have. We secondly explain that we divert very heavy advocacy to the thing that actually needs it. Because the problem with this negative team is that they rely on alternatives such as solar and hydro and wind for their competitive, but, the, but this loses them the, the, the debate because these things already have popular support and they're a futile pursuit. So our case brought about actual effective change on the, part, on the part of the movement that can change government's minds and government's behaviours. The problem is not, is, not that so, is not that nuclear has harms. It is that solar and wind and hydro do not have sufficient benefits to divert us away from carbonised economies that run our world and, are set and ensure people have reasonable standards of living. That was the world that side affirmative brought you. Side negative could never come anywhere close when we take this debate so clearly. Thank you everyone for the debate.